Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Duncan Brands First Quarter 2020 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. As a reminder, today's program may be recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's program, Stacey Caravella, Senior Director, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, everyone. Speaking on today's call will be Duncan Brands Chief Executive Officer, Dave Hoffman, President of Duncan Americas, Scott Murphy, Duncan Brands Chief Financial Officer, Kate Jastron. Following prepared remarks, we'll open the call to questions. Today's call is being webcast live and recorded for replay. Before I turn the call over to Dave, I'd like to remind everyone that the language on forward-looking statements included in our earnings release also applies to our comments made during the call. I'd like to note that we're practicing social distancing, so please bear with us if there are any technical issues during the call. Our release can be found on our website, investor.duncanbrands.com, along with any reconciliation of non-GAAP financial measures mentioned on the call with their corresponding GAAP measures. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dave Hoffman. Thanks, Stacy, and thanks everyone for joining today. You know, it's hard not to notice how different today's call feels from what we normally do. I want to take a moment up front to give a heartfelt thank you to everyone listening in, working from home, and say I hope you're healthy and well. Please stay vigilant. We will get through this together. You know, like all of you, we've had to make decisions without perfect information. But to serve this leadership team well, navigating through this, and all of you, I think, know my years internationally, having been in almost every crisis management foxhole possible. Early on, we rallied around a phrase that no one will remember an overreaction, but they will certainly never forget an underreaction. Our response to COVID started early based on lessons learned from what we were seeing abroad. From day one, our goal, our duty, our obligation has been quite simply to do the right thing. Nothing is more important to us than safety. The decisions we've had to make over the last month are uncharted, but we've moved quickly to do what's right in the face of uncertainty. We've chosen to do what was timely over what was flawless. We've protected people over dollars. We haven't been perfect, but we've done everything we can to look out for our employees, our franchisees, their families, their crew, and of course our customers. Together with our franchisees, we did what was right in our restaurants to protect dedicated crew members and loyal customers. Our franchisees went the extra mile to keep their restaurants open and their people employed wherever they could. We instituted new brand standards, face masks, plexiglass at the counters, latex gloves, and this week, shift infrared thermometers to every location in the U.S. We removed dining room tables and chairs and evolved a model already built for speed into one built for new social distancing protocols. We added curbside pickup, expanded delivery options, and gave incentives for customers to use contactless mobile ordering through our app. Together with our suppliers and other partners, we did what was right for our franchisees to protect their cash flow and preserve their businesses that they built with their families. We like to refer to the partnership among our brand, franchisees, and suppliers as a three-legged stool and are proud to see all three legs standing strong through this crisis. We extended payment terms on royalties and the advertising fund, deferred rent in the corporate properties we control, and worked with vendors lenders, and suppliers to provide additional flexibility to protect franchisee liquidity. The average Duncan franchisee in our system has around 150 employees. As independent business owners, many of them have successfully applied for loans under the Federal Payroll Protection Program. We want to make it clear that as a 100% franchisee-owned and operated system, Duncan Brands has neither applied for nor received any loans from this program. However, we are very grateful for the additional support provided directly to our franchisees through measures such as the CARES Act. 
Lastly, we did what was right for our Duncan Brands employees. I'm proud that we have avoided furloughs since the crisis started. Instead, we identified $45 million in G&A and CapEx savings to preserve cash while protecting our workforce. We cut back on operating expenses, suspended discretionary matching contributions of 401k retirement plans, and made changes to other employee benefits as well. We created a gig program to allow employees with roles impacted by COVID to be reallocated to other critical functional areas. Today, our board of directors also announced that we have suspended our regular dividend program. We believe that a temporary suspension of our dividend is the prudent and responsible thing to do. This management team and our board remain committed to paying dividends over the long term, and we expect to reinstitute that program when it is appropriate to do so. Additionally, our senior leadership team is voluntarily offering reductions in their base salaries from May to August of this year. Our board of directors has also agreed to a reduction in their cash compensation. These savings will be contributed to the Duncan Brands Family Fund, which supports Duncan and Baskin Robbins crew members in times of crisis, such as now. We've got your back is more than just a saying around here. Being in the QSR industry is first and foremost about serving others. Service runs in our blood. Whether that's behind the counter, at the drive-through, or in the hospitals and school parking lots during times of crisis, that's why we're doing everything we can as a company to serve the needs of our franchisees, employees, and communities during these challenging times. It's not just about preserving liquidity or our reputation. It's simply about doing the right thing. I'm touched by the acts of kindness we see every day from our franchisees to support the people in the communities where they live and work. I want to give just a few examples that speak to the heart and soul of our system. Lou and Julie Cabral are assisting children who may not know where their next meal will come from by offering them a free drink, sandwich, and donut at their nine Duncan shops in Richmond, Virginia. Jerry Fives has turned the dining room of one of his restaurants into a sewing room where his employees are sewing face masks for the local senior center in Dixon City, Pennsylvania. In San Diego, franchisee Tally Burton is recognizing medical staff and first responders with free beverages, and the California Highway Patrol is helping bring them to local health care facilities. There are also compelling stories of franchisees helping other franchisees in their communities. For example, in New York City, franchisees are temporarily hiring crew members from other Duncan restaurants that have closed until they can reopen again. We all know the saying, you are judged by the company that you keep. I am very proud of the company we've kept through this crisis. I want to thank all of the crew, guests, franchisees, suppliers, and of course our Duncan Brands employees. You have demonstrated resilience, commitment, and loyalty, and we greatly, greatly appreciate all that you have done to help our restaurants continue to operate. I am incredibly proud of the solidarity within our system. All right, now on to Q1 results. For the full quarter, Duncan U.S. comparable store sales were down 2% versus the prior year. The rapid onset of COVID reversed strong momentum across the system that kick-started the year. During the first 10 weeks of the quarter, Duncan U.S. had 3.5% comparable store sales, on track to deliver the highest quarterly comp since Q3 of 2013. We also had positive traffic for the first time in four years. U.S. comps only declined during the final three weeks of the quarter as shelter-in-place mandates and social distancing practices spread across the country. Average weekly sales have leveled off through the first four weeks of the second quarter, and we are starting to see slight increases week over week. At the end of March and into early April, comparable store sales were down by 35%, and more recently, declines are hovering around 25%. With customers' daily morning routines disrupted, we are seeing a shift in sales across day parts. Sales volumes in the early morning are down, but have picked up from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. as people venture out for a break. 
Approximately 90% of our Duncan U.S. system remains open for off-premise consumption. The thousand or so restaurants that are temporarily closed are primarily located in transportation hubs, college campuses, and the dense urban centers like New York City and Philadelphia. Over the past few weeks, the closure rate has slowed and the number of open stores has been increasing. As we continue to serve our guests during this crisis, we are also focused on ways to quickly bring back morning rituals in the post-pandemic world. We believe our high-frequency, low-touch, affordable ticket business model will serve us very well in the new reality. Now moving to Baskin. Baskin Robbins U.S. also delivered solid results during the first quarter with comparable store sales up 1.8%. Through the first 10 weeks of the quarter, Baskin had 11% comparable store sales and positive traffic. We're pleased to see the quarter close with positive results despite the impact of sales and traffic from COVID. More than 90% of U.S. locations remain open today. Our international business was also on track to deliver significant gains in Q1. Through the end of February, Duncan International had 7.2% comps and Baskin International had 7% comps. They ended the first quarter with a minus 7.1% and a positive 2.5% comps, respectively. Many of our international markets remain completely shut down and others continue to be restricted by curfews or are delivery only. In total, approximately 50% of our international portfolio is open. The closures are split about equally between both brands. Undoubtedly, the world will be a different place when the COVID pandemic is over. Until that time, we will continue to do what we've always done, stay true to our values of being strong, smart, and kind. We'll do the best we can with the information in front of us and feel confident knowing we've done the right thing in the face of adversity. We think people need a little joy in their lives right now, and we're proud to play a role in providing that safely. Once again, I want to thank all of the crew members, guests, franchisees, suppliers, and Duncan Brands employees who have had our backs during this crisis. And now I will hand it over to Scott to cover the Duncan U.S. business in more depth. Scott. Thanks, Dave. These are truly unprecedented times for our industry, our franchisees, and our communities. But I've never been prouder of how we've come together with our franchisees than in this time of crisis. We've been guided by four key principles. One, ensure the safety of our franchisees, crew, and customers. Two, provide flexibility to simplify the operations in restaurants. Three, support our franchisees with financial assistance where possible. And four, empower quick, field-based decision-making as conditions change. As I talk about each one of these, it's important to note that everything we've done over the past seven weeks has been done in concert with our franchisee leadership. And I want to publicly thank them for their tireless efforts as we stand shoulder to shoulder in this crisis. Ensuring the safety of our crew and customers will remain our top priority. We quickly made a series of decisions as the COVID situation escalated. It started with more frequent hand washing and required hygiene videos. It progressed to single-use gloves, face masks, and plexiglass shields at the front counter. We removed tables and chairs and converted the entire system to takeout and drive-through only. We marked six-foot increments on the floor tile to encourage social distancing when in line and suspended our refillable mug program. We encouraged paying with our mobile app and saw nice growth in our on-the-go platform as people sought out our contactless option in-store. Our independent franchisee-owned supply chain co-op implemented touchless delivery of supplies in the back room with new digital receipt technology. And we have ordered infrared thermometers for each store and will continue to follow the CDC guidelines for essential workers as they evolve in the coming weeks. Providing flexibility to franchisees was our next step. With the widespread stay-at-home orders and significant reductions in restaurant traffic, we saw as many as 1,200 restaurants temporarily close. We offered franchisees the opportunity to shrink core operating hours, and most stores are now closing by 7 p.m. This allowed for more time at night for rigorous cleaning, and importantly, 
allowed crew to spend time with their families. Almost 2,000 stores closed their front lobby entirely and focused exclusively on the drive through as customers showed a preference for staying in their vehicles. We offered curbside ordering through our app, and it's already generating about 2% of transactions for the almost 1,000 stores using this feature. Delivery through Grubhub, Uber Eats, and other partners is now available at more than 4,000 restaurants across the country. And since March 12th, delivery sales have grown steadily, now 1.4% of sales at participating restaurants, with over three times our normal ticket. We also limited certain varieties of products to improve speed and reduce complexity at the restaurant. And we've gone as far as to develop a radically reduced menu called the Essentials Menu that is a great alternative for a franchisee who may only have access to a limited staff but still wants to serve our guests. As Kate will discuss further, in the initial weeks of the outbreak, we worked hard to provide financial relief to franchisees to help them preserve cash flow by extending payment terms on royalties and ad fees, as well as rent on the 900 corporate properties we control. Many of our franchisees have been in our system for years or even decades but they still appreciated it when we engaged external experts and hosted a series of webinars to provide recommendations and share best practices on how to negotiate with their own landlords and banks on deferment and how to apply for CARES Act loans. Recently, we created tools to help them track the loans and uses of funds to stay within forgiveness guidelines. And I must say I'm impressed with how the extended Duncan family of vendors and partners came through with assistance to our franchisees in this time of need. It was the very support these small business owner franchisees needed for March and April. We're also giving more flexibility on the timing of other franchisee capital expenditure commitments, such as the purchase of equipment, remodels, and new restaurant builds. We've reached out to every single remodel or new store that is planned for the next two quarters to offer flexibility in dates. While it's still too early to predict overall numbers, many franchisees have asked for some extra time, while others have expressed a desire to continue. Some are choosing to preserve cash in the short term, while some are taking advantage of slower restaurants to conduct a remodel. It is fair to say, however, that we will see a temporary slowdown in remodels and new store development as we navigate this crisis. But we've already started brainstorming on how remodels and new builds should look in this post-COVID world. We've also slowed down our installations of the new Smart Brewer hot coffee machines to respect the stay-at-home orders in many states, but plan to resume installations next month. And finally, remember, our franchisees also share in the profits of our CPG business in the United States, which had a solid quarter, particularly in March with K-Cup, bagged coffee, and ready-to-drink coffee sales through our partners Keurig Dr. Pepper, J.M. Smucker, and the Coca-Cola Company. Our last principle is around staying nimble and making quick decisions. We have scaled back our national media spend and paused on launching new, potentially complex, limited-time offers. We have thoughtfully started to return to media with appropriate messaging thanking our first responders and our crew members through our Raise a Cup campaign. You'll see a rotating suite of content on our social channels and increasingly in traditional media as well. Our marketing leadership team continues to create, assess, and refine a phased approach for relaunching our brand responsibly at the right time as the state governors signal a return to normalcy. In the meantime, you'll see us smartly rely on digital marketing as it has proven the most nimble and effective tool during COVID. And by the way, it's worth noting that all of these efforts are not just for Duncan U.S., but are happening at Baskin as well. So, these four principles have served us well and will continue to guide our decision-making moving forward. Although times have been tough, our model is strong. Great coffee fast in a high-frequency, low-touch environment is what we're all about, even before COVID. Our franchisees are strong. They are eagerly serving their communities across the country and can't wait to do more. I'm so proud of all the work of our teams, our partners, and mostly our franchisees and crew members have accomplished. And while I know this is just the beginning and we have a lot of work ahead of us, 
I can't think of a better group to partner with than our Duncan and Baskin franchisees. And with that, I will turn it over to Kate to cover our financials and liquidity. Kate? Thanks, Scott. While my commentary will primarily be around the current state of the business, let me quickly take you through the results of the first quarter. In the first quarter, Duncan Brands franchisees and licensees opened 38 net new restaurants globally. This included seven net new Duncan U.S. locations, inclusive of the closure of 12 Speedway locations, 14 Baskin Robbins International locations, and 23 Duncan International locations, offset by net closures of six Baskin Robbins U.S. locations. Additionally, Duncan U.S. franchisees remodeled 32 restaurants, and Baskin-Robbins U.S. franchisees remodeled six restaurants during the first quarter. Revenues for the first quarter increased approximately $4 million, or 1.3%, compared to the prior year period due to an increase in sales of ice cream and other products, as well as an increase in other revenues driven primarily by license fees related to Duncan K-Cup pods and retail packaged coffee. Q1 operating income and adjusted operating income of approximately $101 million and $106 million, respectively, were relatively flat compared to the prior year period as increases in net margin on ice cream and other products and net income from our joint ventures, as well as the increase in other revenues, were offset by an increase in G&A expense. The increase in G&A expense was primarily due to an increase in training expenses associated with the rollout of new high-volume brewers and an increase in reserves for uncollectible receivables. Net income and adjusted net income for Q1 of $52.1 million and $55.5 million, respectively, were relatively flat compared to the prior year period. Diluted earnings per share and diluted adjusted earnings per share of $0.63 cents and $0.67, cents, respectively, also remained flat compared to the prior year period. We should note that first quarter adjusted operating income included approximately $7 million of estimated impact related to COVID-19, including the impact to royalties, bad debt reserves, and G&A expenses relating to the safety materials and training. Although we deferred royalty, advertising fee, rent, and other cash collections the last few weeks of the first quarter, we continued to recognize revenue. It's in times like these that we appreciate the low cash needs of our business model. We also ended fiscal 2019 with one of the highest cash balances since we became a public company in 2011. We returned 97 million in cash to shareholders during the quarter, including 33 million in dividends and 64 million through open market share repurchases. Let me be clear. We stopped repurchasing shares under our share repurchase program as soon as it became clear that we would be unable to predict the immediate impact of COVID-19 on our business. Given the market uncertainty arising from COVID-19 and to ensure we could continue to have access to funds, we took a precautionary measure in March and borrowed the remaining $116 million under our variable funding notes. This step was taken to further strengthen our financial flexibility to help navigate this challenging situation. Excluding cash reserved for gift cards and advertising funds of $195 million, we ended the quarter with $381 million in unrestricted cash held domestically and $25 million held in accounts outside of the United States. As required under our debt agreements, our restricted cash reserve of $73 million includes approximately three months of debt service amounts including principal and interest. And, as Dave mentioned earlier, we announced that our Board of Directors has suspended our regular dividend program. The suspension of our Q2 2020 dividend will result in cash savings of approximately $33 million and will reinforce our already strong balance sheet position. We believe that temporary suspension of our dividend is the prudent and responsible thing to do. As Dave noted, the Board of Directors remains committed to paying dividends over the long term, and we expect to reinstitute the program when it is appropriate to do so. Given our strong balance sheet, 
our low capital expenditures, and our ability to leverage G&A, we anticipate that we will have sufficient cash to cover our debt obligations and to cover operating costs, even if current conditions were to remain for a prolonged period. We will continue to manage our liquidity very closely by controlling our operating and capital expenditures and have ceased nearly all non-essential spending. We have also been able to work with many of our landlords and vendors to either reduce or defer payments and have significantly scaled back our marketing spend to retain ad fund balances. By making smart, tactical decisions around reducing or delaying certain expenses, we have been able to significantly reduce our outlay of cash while also managing the business for the long term and ensuring we best position ourselves for the future. The beauty of our model is our ability to leverage our G&A, and we will continue to do so until the business normalizes. Our average monthly G&A and CapEx cash burn prior to the pandemic was approximately 20 to 25 million. We estimate with current conditions and the steps we have taken to protect our liquidity, our revised average monthly G&A and capital expenditure cash burn will be approximately 15 to 20 million until the business returns to normal. Again, that is outgoing funds for G&A and capital expenditures only. On top of that, we also expect to save approximately $6 million in taxes in fiscal 2020 as a result of the CARES Act. Moving to our leverage, we ended the first quarter with a debt-to-adjusted EBITDA ratio of 5 to 1. As a reminder, our leverage is calculated net of cash. Based on the leverage ratios specified in our debt agreement and where we ended Q1, we are not required to make and do not plan to make our Q2 2020 principal payment. This helps us to conserve approximately $8 million of cash outflow in the second quarter of 2020. It is also important to note that we do not have any maturities coming due on our debt until February of 2024. Turning to debt covenants, the primary financial covenant under our securitization is a debt service coverage ratio. The ratio is calculated at the end of each quarter on a trailing 12-month basis. There are various covenant triggers based on this coverage ratio, the first of which would result in 50% of our excess cash flows being segregated in a separate account for debt repayment purposes. This cash trapping event would occur only if our debt service coverage ratio fell below 1.75 times. We finished the first quarter of fiscal 2020 with a debt service coverage ratio of 3.27 times. Therefore, our trailing 12-month cash flows would need to fall by nearly 50% before reaching the first trigger of this covenant. Based on extensive scenario modeling, we do not expect that current business results coupled with any of the actions we've taken, such as the extension of franchisee payment terms, will impact our ability to meet cash needs in the ordinary course or to comply with the covenants under our securitization. We do have the ability and available capacity under our securitization agreement to take on additional debt, both within and outside of the securitization market, should we choose. However, we do not currently have plans to seek additional financing at this time. Due to the evolving nature and uncertainty related to COVID-19 and its impact on financial and operational results, we are withdrawing our fiscal year 2020 targets issued on February 6th and our long-term growth targets issued on February 7th, 2019. Now more than ever, it's about supporting our franchisees. Our relationships with our franchisees are incredibly strong and collectively our franchisee system is financially healthy. We are working hard to ensure our operators have the financial resources and store level liquidity to get through these challenging times. To this end, we temporarily extended payment terms for royalties and advertising fees for franchisees in the United States and Canada to provide them with more financial flexibility to enable them to better support their employees and guests. Specifically, for 60 days, we extended franchisee payment terms on royalties and ad fees from 12 days to 45 days. We've also waived rental payments for one month and allowed them to defer rental payments for two months on our approximately 900 properties for which we are the landlord. And we worked with countless third-party service vendors to defer payments, such as technology fees, equipment enrollments, 
software fees, and other service contracts. We have recently engaged in encouraging discussions with our franchisees and licensees regarding a transition back to standard payment terms that will meet both of our needs and should ensure we receive cash collections from the majority of our system for much of the second quarter. Duncan Brands and our franchisees have long-standing productive relationships with many of the lenders with whom we work. Collectively, we have weathered tough times before, as many have conducted business with our franchisees for more than 30 years. Early on, we began hosting multiple calls with our franchisee lender banks, reminding them of the small business nature of our franchisees and that, in conjunction with what we were committed to do from a franchisor perspective, they would also need their partnership. Most lenders have been extremely supportive, many deferring principal and or interest payments, extending lines of credit when requested, and continuing to lend to franchisees who choose to advance with their remodels and new store development. We have also been in constant contact with our franchisees and have engaged external experts to help them navigate areas such as approaching landlords and to request rent relief, managing staffing levels, determining what operating hours would be best for their restaurant given their individual circumstances, adhering to local, local government regulations, and accessing federal assistance. Additionally, we've been in frequent communication with our franchisees on the CARES Act and the potential support and benefits that they were eligible to access. Throughout the process, we've continued to work closely with our franchisees to ensure that they are well-educated on the loan application process, had the proper information on hand as required to apply for the loans, and are prepared to manage their payroll and occupancy data to ensure they maximize the benefits of the programs. While we don't typically discuss the average Duncan U.S. franchisee, I think it's important to give some more color around their cash flow. We expect that the average traditional Duncan restaurant franchisee's operating cash flow for the full year will be down significantly as a result of depressed sales. However, the majority of our franchisees quickly flexed operating hours, payroll, and food costs to match comp trends and reduced operating costs and capital expenditures as much as possible. Keeping all six costs the same, then layering in the funding the average franchisee could receive from the CARES Act programs, we anticipate franchisee operating cash flow by the end of fiscal 2020 to approximate approximate 80% of where we expected it to be at the beginning of the year, even with significantly lower sales projections. The 80% reflects a representative estimate for a traditional Duncan standalone restaurant that receives government assistance. This estimate also does not include any other relief that our franchisees may receive from their banks, landlords, or vendors. It's also worth noting that the CARES Act included a retroactive technical correction to the depreciation treatment of qualified improvement property that was missed in the original tax overhaul. The correction allows franchisees to take 100% depreciation on qualified remodels completed in 2018 and 2019 immediately as opposed to depreciating them over 39 years. We expect the average franchisee who completed remodels in those years to amend their fiscal 2018 tax returns and apply the correction to remodels within their 2019 tax returns. We estimate that this will result in additional cash benefit of approximately $10,000 to $40,000 per remodel. Given these measures and the flexibility on the timing of franchisee capital expenditure commitments, such as the purchase of equipment, remodels, and new restaurant builds, we are very confident in the financial health of our franchisees. In closing, strong franchisee relationships will get us through this crisis. We're all in this together. We've got each other's back. Now I'll turn it back to the operator for Q&A. Operator? Certainly, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press star then one on your touchstone telephone. If your question has been answered and you'd like to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Our first question comes from the line of John Ivanko from J.P. Morgan. Your question, please. Um, hi, thank you so much. I hope everyone is well. Um, yeah, I just wanted to you know, talk about you know, some of the, the franchise economics, if I could. Even at uh, you know, down 20% same-store sales, I would think that most of your franchisees would make money at the store level, make cash at the store level, maybe even 
you know, I, I, you know the relative to some other companies, that's a, a substantial amount of money at the store level. So, you know, just kind of walk us through, you know, what you see franchise store level you know, break even is, you know, I guess, relative to 2019 average unit volume. And I guess using that as a starting point, you know, talk about whether, uh, you know, deferral of rents, deferral of royalties, you know, something that you that you would anticipate having to do at all. Uh, you know, going forward, I guess, is, is the first point. And secondly, you're know, considering that you have you know, done some of this and you know, franchisees have successfully applied for PPP, if there's been a, a review of the leverage levels, you know, at the franchise le- at the fran- franchise organization level, that may you know, be influencing their cash flow at the organization level. And if there's an opportunity, you know, longer term to begin to work with them to start to rein in some of those, uh, you know, those leverage levels that have gotten higher over time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, John, um, and uh, good to hear from you. Uh, hey, uh, you got a, a lot in that question there. Let me start with, uh, you know, uh, franchisee economics uh, in the first one there. Uh, look, Scott and Kate's team put together what I, I thought was a uh, really smart tool that they sent out to the franchisees uh, to show various breakpoints with uh, the uh, comp sales uh, going negative. And so there was a break point to your, to your, you know, comment. There was a break point at, uh, negative EBITDA, but then there was a break point further down, uh, that, uh, in order to cover fixed costs. So I think this allowed each franchisee to evaluate, uh, where they were at, uh, you know, their, their fixed cost needs around, you know, whether it was rent and utilities. Uh, in debt and things like that, and how far they could go down. So uh, we modeled that out, and it was a tremendous tool to help the franchisees say, you know, even if you got to the negative EBITDA level, you were still better off staying open. Uh, and uh, we never had to touch that point, but it was a, a really well-delivered tool. And I think uh, to your comment, yes, uh, uh, we've weathered well, even at those uh, uh, aggressive negative comp numbers. We've seen uh, some uptake recently. Uh, there's a whole bunch of factors that you can imagine around that, whether that's stimulus or, uh, you know, markets opening up, et cetera. So uh, that's been one uh, that I think has been uh, uh, really good for us to see with the health of our franchisees. On the deferral program, we've just introduced um, our a, a program on how we're going to collect that. Uh, it was in collaboration, a partnership with our, with our franchisees, and so um, it's got various uh, – levers to pull for the franchisee to help them with their liquidity. Some are stronger than others, but we wanted to, as Kate said in the uh, in her comments, this was all about making sure that we uh, protected the uh, financial health of our franchisees and made sure that they were strong during all of this. So um, we're not going to give out uh, too much details around that, but uh, our franchisees are pleased with uh, our extended rent payments, our extended uh, you know, uh, franchisee fee and, and marketing fee payments. So uh, we feel good about that. And um, uh, I think let me leave it there unless you have another follow-up, John. The, the question was also on the fr- uh, leverage at the franchisee organization level. And, yes, I, I know I hit on a couple of big topics there. I mean, if that's – if yeah, that's something that you've you know, kind of had the chance to go back and, and look at and, you know, maybe uh, you know, reducing some of those leverage levels that probably have ticked up as they have for the rest of the industry, whether reducing some of those leverage levels might make sense for some of the franchisees over time. In other words, if you're kind of taking this crisis and making it kind of a broader, a broader conversation around capital structure at the franchisee level. Yeah, John, this is Kate. Um, great question. I would say one of the, the best things that's come out of this, if there's anything, is uh, we've proven that our relationships with our franchisee lenders are strong and enhanced those. Um, so I, I actually feel like our franchisees, the majority of them, are in a very good place. Obviously, some are more levered than others. Uh, those that just did new store openings or remodels in the past few years uh, tend to have a little bit more leverage, and obviously the larger the organization, um, they may have more leverage. But we feel very good about the health of our franchisees. Our lenders stepped in very quickly to help defer principal and interest to work through with the franchisees. Uh, They also continue to lend to our franchisees that have decided to uh, pursue their remodels and openings, which I think is a great sign of their belief in the health of our system. Um, And so while we are working with our franchisees, uh, there's the very few that may be in a distressed situation. We have a group that's working with them on helping them get through these situations. It's, it's a, a smaller population than I think you, you believe, and I think we have great uh, ability to work with those lenders. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for the caller. Thank you. Operator, next question. 
Our next question comes from line of David Palmer from Evercore ISI. Your question, please. Thanks. Uh, and good morning, and uh, great opening remarks uh, this morning. I, uh, I hear you guys are doing a great job uh, out there in terms of uh, support. Wanted to ask about you know the, your thinking about the pace of recovery, and where I'm going with this is you know there has been these this in, this income that that uh, consumers have gotten. Uh, from the checks that started coming through on April 15, a lot of restaurants out there got a big boost from that. And it, the boost hasn't been as great for some of the coffee players, and it kind of shows where coffee fits in people's lives. It really comes from being on the go. So you you guys need people to get back to work. And so we're going to have unemployment factors. We're going to have the social distancing factors. You know, how do you think about this in terms of your pace to of recovery through 2020, and and how are you thinking about ways to combat the inevitable lingering unemployment that we're going to have as we go into 21? Yeah, uh, thanks, David, and uh, uh, a lot of good nuggets in there as well. I, I would say the the first thing, you know, in, in terms of what the new reality is going to look like, the way we're preparing for that, however soon or long it takes to get there, is look, uh, it's going to be around safety. Uh, of course, and then how to access brands uh, in a big way. And, and we've made a lot of investments in that, but we're continuing to accelerate that. So on the safety side, we, we don't look at these as costs. We look at these as investments. So uh, we've got a brand standard around gloves, masks, plexiglass guards, and just this past week, Scott and team have shipped uh, infrared thermometers uh, to every restaurant, Dunkin' and BR, uh, in the U.S. And so those are investments that we made that we think is going to be critical uh, do I feel safe as an employee? Do I feel safe as a customer? And they're going to be looking for trusted brands to deliver against that. I think the, the second thing that, you know, you, you touch on is access to brands. Uh, we've actually seen, and, and look, whether it's stimulus checks or probably a host of other factors, uh, you heard us talk about uh, in March, minus 35% comps was probably the, the uh, deepest. Uh, now we're hovering around minus 20 to minus 25%. Uh, somewhere in that range, and and again, uh, it, it's all it's going to be about how can you create greater access to your brands. Before uh, the crisis, 90% of our traffic uh, was some form of takeaway, so it was easier for us to accelerate into this. But uh, uh, you know, drive-throughs, we've added a thousand uh, curbside locations during this delivery. We've doubled our footprint from 2,000 to 4,000 stores. Digital, you know, we were making a lot of investments, and Stephanie's on the line. She can talk about uh, uh, one in five transactions now are, are through a loyalty member. On the go is doubled during this. And even channel, uh, you know, while we're a habitual brand, um, you know, channel, we do a billion dollars of retail sales through channel. And in the grocery, our, our bag coffee and our K-cups are up around 20 to 30% now performing the category. So uh, we feel good about that. Um, uh, you're right about uh, the high unemployment numbers. Um, and, you know, value is going to play a part, and that has been one of uh, the strong uh, pillars of our triangle offense, you know, which was, you know, all about beverage and menu innovation, uh, value, and digital acceleration. And so value will continue to play a, a major role uh, in whatever that new reality looks like. So we think we're well positioned, and this is a, a business model that we've been refining for 70 years. And, and again, uh, I think next gen and what we're doing around that just continues to uh, fit in that uh, new reality. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of John Glass from Morgan Stanley. Your question, please. Hi, thanks. Good morning from Boston. And, yeah, we've pivoted to a, an at-home model here, too. We've got the biggest can of Dunkin' Coffee I think I've ever seen on our kitchen counter, so helping those 20% at-home business grow. Um, on, on First, on the on the business, right, so – since it's a morning business and since the work from home and disruption, that, that routine is going to be disrupted for a time being. How do you think about how you can drive business outside of the traditional morning hours? Are you already thinking about either promotional activity or operational changes that can get people through, you know, in the non-traditional hours? And then I had a follow-up on, uh, a follow-up on the franchisee health, please. Yeah, uh, and, and thanks for the, the Duncan love in home. Uh, we want to be there for you however you want to use us. 
Uh, John, what, as you know, and, and David said this earlier, you know, uh, we, we get people started in the morning, and uh, we do well when people are moving about. Uh, we've seen the decline in the 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, part of the business, but we've seen a nice uptick on the 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So we're positive in that time frame. So, you know, whether that's, uh, hey, people are getting a little cabin fever and they want to come out uh, for their cup of coffee or whatever, but we feel like we've been able to capture that. And if you remember, our approach here uh, has always been to move into that second day part in the afternoon. We had our happy hour promotion. So customers have started to become accustomed to us. The espresso played very well to that. Some of the snacking that we've uh, been working on, we've got croissant stuffers in uh, uh, the restaurants right now uh, that play to that sort of afternoon occasion, and we think uh, are, you know, uh, there's a lot of simplicity in the preparation of those for the franchisees, but they also pair very well with our espresso and, and ice beverages. So we think we can make that appropriate shift. But, again, I, I keep coming back to uh, the first priority is uh, uh, customers are going to seek out trusted brands, and, uh, and and we are one of those trusted brands. And then we've made, I think, smart strategic investments in, into safety. But then it's going to be about access. And we've been really heavily vigilant on expanding our access and accentuating that, whether that's, again, digital uh, acceleration, drive through delivery, curbside, channel, et cetera. Uh, we are continuing to double down on that. We're very pleased with what we're seeing out of digital. Uh, we've got 400,000. Uh, new members, what we call our, our 90 day, um, um, you know, active users. Uh, we've, we've grown that by 400,000 new users from Q4 to Q1. Uh, so a, a, a nice number on our base. And on the go, uh, has doubled. And in many of our, uh, non drive through locations, uh, it's even, uh, um, you know, greater than that, 4x, 5x that. So, uh, we feel really good on how we're positioned and how we're going to win in that new reality. Thank you. Can I just ask just a very simple follow-up? What, what portion of the seven million? I think you said that included a number of items, but including bad debt. What was the bad debt? And I don't. I know there's an accounting change. So what is the comparable number? And what, what percentage of your franchisees now are in arrears on payments that that would reflect? Yeah. So I'll take the latter first. Um, so right now we're just coming out of the deferral period for our franchisees. So. Um, we actually don't have anybody in arrears because they're just coming out of that deferral period. I would say the majority of our franchisees, we do a direct pull from their, their bank account, so it's very rare that there would be anybody in arrears. And then internationally, uh, we work specifically with our licensees. Um, they're typically on a longer payment term but are typically compliant with those payment terms. Um, within the seven, the seven million, uh, the, the, impact of, of bad debt is very low. Uh, I would call it, you know, somewhere around a, a million dollars. So um, that, that number consists primarily of our estimate of royalty impact, um, increase in G&A things like training and equipment for safety, uh, you know, gloves and, and training programs around hygiene for the stores, et cetera, um, and then is offset by a reduction, obviously, in our um, bonus at STI program. So bad debt is a small portion of that. Got Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes in the line of Jeffrey Brenstein from Barclays. Your question, please. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, just wanted to uh, ask a broader question. Dave, I know you mentioned that you know, you've often been in crisis management throughout your career, um, so obviously some good perspective. <laughs> it does seem like from an independent restaurant standpoint, um, this is somewhat of an existential crisis. Just wondering how you think about the future for the industry, the supply demand imbalance that has perhaps existed, maybe that eases, and on the heels of that, whether in the future, if your franchisee demand is still strong, whether you'd see better real estate opportunities post some of these closures or market share opportunity, how do you think about one, the broader industry, and then two, Duncan's positioning within that to come out stronger and perhaps grow faster on the heels of it? Yeah, thanks, Jeff, uh, and good morning. Uh, you know, part of you first have to step back with all the the, the things when you get into these situations, and, and they are all unique, these these uh, different crisis management situations. But I, I think you have to evaluate your business model and say, where are you strong? And I, I, get, I come back to uh, 90% of our transactions prior to the crisis were some form of takeaway. So uh, we were, we are, and we've been, our franchisees have been um, uh, refining a model that I think is adaptable and will win 
in whatever the new reality uh, looks like, and that's been low-touch, high-frequency, affordable ticket. I, I, I firmly believe uh, that's a winning formula for a trusted brand that's been around for, for 70 years. And so, um, you know, the, the only other thing I would say that we're focused on right now um, that, uh, you know, we've done a lot of uh, really great work led by Scott and, and uh, Kate and a whole bunch of people behind the scenes with our franchisees. And, you know, whether that's webinars, weekly calls, uh, we've been very tight as a system uh, and making sure that all three legs of the stool, our franchisees, our brand, and our suppliers uh, are all equal. So uh, we've our solidarity uh, was great before. It has never been better than it is right now. And so uh, we're heavily focused on coming out of this. The one thing I would say is we've got a, a separate team called the Green Team that, that is very focused. They're, they're uh, completely separate from the daily crisis management team. And, and this was from some of my learnings where you get them off, they evaluate the business model, they look at what our opportunities are. Real estate, as you're talking about, is one of them, but also how we're going to emerge from this uh, in, in multiple phases. Our, right now, we're making investments in safety and brand trust. We think that's the right place to be. Uh, the next phase is going to be a, a sort of a scrappy ramp-up phase for us. And then finally, uh, and look, we're going to follow uh, the science with the CDC and local health officials, uh, and it may be uh, piecemeal across the con country, but we are going to have a breakout at some point. And so that green team is, is efforting through all of that uh, and also taking a look at uh, where, we can, where we can be opportunistic uh, in terms of uh, real estate plays and things like that. So I think the real estate comment uh, is spot on, Jeff, as you know, where we have white space and can grow. So I think that's one that uh, we feel uh, also fits into the opportunity set for us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Tarantino from Baird. Your question, please. Hi. Good morning. hope everyone's doing well. I, I had a couple of questions. First, I was wondering if you could frame up the risk that you might see some store closures, um, you know, amid all the sales weakness we're seeing here. I know you, you did a great job outlining average franchisee profitability, but I'm, I'm specifically wondering, you know, if you had some marginal performers coming in, um, if those, um, those units or those franchisees might be at risk of closing more permanently. And any way to frame that up at this point, and then I have a follow-up question. Thanks. Yeah, hey, David, it's Scott. It's a great question and something we started working on as part of that green team that Dave mentioned. Um, you know, we've got about a 1,000 temp closed stores now, and we're looking at every single one of them with our franchisee. Because you're absolutely right. Maybe some of those low-performing or marginal-performing stores, maybe there is an opportunity to – to consolidate, to reload, to add a drive-through in a better location, and we're having, we're starting to have those conversations with the franchisees now. A little too early to put our arms around exactly how many, but we're having those conversations right now. Great, great, thank you. And then the the second question I had was related to the morning day part. You know, it's a lot of kind of routines and routine behavior and. I guess as consumers have been knocked out of their routine for a prolonged period, and it might be an even longer period, just just wondering your thoughts on how you how you get them back on the routine of going to Dunkin' daily, and what what levers you plan to pull to try to drive that business. Yeah, uh, David, on that one, you're right. Uh, we're very much a habitual brand, and uh, look, it's what the the team is working on. Whether that's in the uh, the ramp up or the breakout phase, uh, value is going to play a, a, a big part in that, and um, sort of a welcome back, thank you to America uh, type of uh, you know uh, campaign. So we we think we're because we've been strong in that area. We think that's going to play very well. Um, our our guests have really appreciated that we've been open. Uh, we've been very focused, as I said, on safety, but. Uh, uh, we've been trying to do the right thing in the communities that we serve, stay open, uh, serve those first responders, healthcare workers, all the people that are keeping the communities running right now. And um, we, we've been doing that, and our franchisees uh, have been incredible with the restaurant crews uh, during all of this. So, um, and, and we have to look at what's the mindset of the consumer going forward in terms of transportation. You know, it, it, the, the starting hour for – the commute may go earlier if people are 
driving more than they are taking public transportation. They may have to start earlier. So um, we think we're nimble enough. We've been very flexible with our franchisees on hours of operations, limited menu, as you heard from Scott. But we think we've got a business model that is nimble um, and is is built for uh, what the new reality, uh, whatever it's going to look like, uh, we're ready to uh, adapt and win in that environment. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes on the line of Matt DeFrisco from Guggenheim. Your question, please. Thank you. Um, Kate, with res- thank you for all that detail on the cash flow. I think that's important to understand. I just wanted to um, understand how many stores potentially could fit in there, How many? what percent of your franchisees, um, roughly received the CARES Act, and then if you could just remind us, looking back in 18 and 19 on those remodels, how many stores have that potential, to, or how many franchisees sort of fall in and getting that potential of the 10 to 40K cash benefit also? Yeah, um, on the CARES Act, we, we haven't actually collected how many of our franchisees have applied. I would just say the majority of our um, Baskin franchisees, you know, own less than two stores on average, um, and so that was clearly a great program for them. And then on the Duncan side, the average franchisee employs about 150 crew members, um, so also a great program for them. So they had relationships already with many of the lenders and banks that helped them work through the SBA process. Um, we believe PPP was the program that they preferred through the CARES Act, but um, I think the majority would be eligible and um, would qualify for the payroll, um, you know, waiver that would come out of that. But unfortunately, we don't have um, data collected on how many of them received them. The majority I'm expecting has. And then on the uh, remodel side, how many sort of get that 10 to 40 percent accelerated depreciation benefit? And that that was not included in your 80 percent um, cash flow metrics. That would be on top of it. Um, it is actually uh, included in there um, at, at the lower end, so we put the 10000 in. Um, there's hundreds of stores that have gone through the remodel process, and actually Baskin U.S. would also have some of those as well. So hundreds of franchisees, they can actually um, amend their 2018 tax returns as well as apply it in 2019 and then take advantage now as we go into 2020. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Eric Gonzalez from KeyBank. Your question, please. Hey, thanks. I'm glad everyone sounds like they're doing well. Um, I appreciate the commentary on, on same-store sales trends, but if you could maybe clarify whether you remove the temporary store closures from the comp base. I think in the release it said that the down 25% uh, was excluding the store closures, and then I have a, a follow-up question on, on perks. Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that our comp works is if a store reported a sale, any sale, um, in the week in this year versus last year, um, it will be included in that comp base. So for the the weeks that they closed, they are included in there. If they've been completely closed through the week, they are removed. So um, the guide that that Dave was referring to, approximately 20 to 20, 25%. Um, excludes the majority of the uh, approximately 1,000 temp closed. We anticipate if you put that in, it's probably about another five basis points. The down, so there's a down 35% number that you spoke about at the trough. Does that include the closures or exclude the closures? I'm sorry. Could you? Re- I, I couldn't. You cut out in the middle there. Could you repeat that? Uh, the, the negative 35% that the trough uh, comp declined in the late in late March. Does that encompass the thousand stores closed over that time period? No, it was it was consistent the exact way that I just described it. So if the store okay. was open for any day during the week, it was in. If it was closed, okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. On on perks, um, as a follow-up, I don't think there was a lot of commentary in the prepared remarks, but maybe there's a little bit in the Q&A. But I was wondering, you know, is the crisis an opportunity to, you know, expand the usage of your, expand the usage of your mobile app and perhaps drive user growth? And if you could talk about, like, the percentage of digital orders either before and after the crisis began, whether you saw any increasing um, or acceleration in user growth? Yeah, Stephanie's on the Hi, line here. Yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. Hi, thanks, Dave. Um, hi, Eric. It's Stephanie Meltzer Paul. Yeah, we've been really pleased with our performance on perks. Um, we're up about 300 basis points just from March to April. So right now, perks is, a, is around 18% of sales and 20% of transactions, and it's growing every week. 
As Dave mentioned previously, our on-the-go is doubling. We're up to 7% of rooftop sales coming from mobile ordering. We've been definitely leaning into our marketing and um, being able to acquire 400,000 new active members quarter over quarter. So we're gaining a lot of new and reactive, reactivated members during this time, um, and we feel really good about our perks program and the marketing that we're doing and how that's helping drive customers into our stores during this time who are really still looking for their Dunkin'. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Sharon Zakpia from William Blair. Your question, please. Hi. Good morning. I was hoping you could um, talk a bit about any kind of divergence you're seeing in the comp trend between drive through and non drive through locations. Um, and then secondarily, um, in terms of menu innovation, I know you had a pretty good pipeline of menu innovation set for this year. Does the current um, disruption kind of change your thoughts on, on how you pursue menu innovation in 2020? Hey, Sharon, it's Scott. Um, drive through obviously, is a big part of our business, almost 70% of the store. And as you might imagine, uh, performing significantly better than the non drive through stores, so probably three times better. And it's interesting to note, stores that have a drive through almost 94 or 95% of the sales are going through the drive through So it speaks to how powerful that drive through is. And not surprisingly, the markets that have predominant drive throughs are doing better than those that don't. You know, Dave mentioned curbside, which is sort of a, a drive through for the non drive through if you will, and we're seeing some nice growth um, for stores that don't have a drive through when they've adding when they've started to add curbside. So it's a good way for the consumers to get that product without having to come in the store. Uh, as far as innovation, we do have a strong pipeline lined up moving forward, but we are looking at it exactly as you mentioned. You know, what, as, as the consumer behavior probably changes a little bit, as that day part shifts a little to the middle of the day, um, as people start to maybe do a little more bulk ordering or even on the go, um, we are looking at different products for different day parts. So that is part of the pipeline and the innovation work that we're looking at. Okay. I think, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Dennis Gunyer from UBS. Your question, please. Great. Thanks for the question. Uh, Dave, you touched briefly uh, a bit, I think, on some of the potential future white space opportunities that, that could arise emerging from this. Just wondering if you, if you could talk a bit more about some of the puts and takes around unit growth considerations looking out over the, over the next couple of years, maybe, you know, recognizing you don't have a, a crystal ball, but how do you think about maybe some of the incremental opportunities that could arise and then kind of thinking about some of the, you know, how difficult maybe access to capital uh, may be. I think all the, the color on, on the health of the franchisees is, is great. But just anything more, Dave, that you could provide on kind of some of those those puts and takes looking ahead, um, knowing what you know right now. Thanks. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Dennis. Uh, uh, look, uh, we, if I step back and take a look at the next-gen uh, uh, model that we've got out there, um, you know, Again, that is built, I think, for this new reality. And when I talk about access uh, and having great access, we may accentuate th certain things, but it's a heavy focus on drive-through. It's a heavy focus on on-the-go and expanding that to a, a higher level. So there may be more things that we accentuate in, as part of this, but we think that's a model that plays well going forward. We're really pleased, not, not able to share at this point, but we're pleased with the willingness of the franchisees uh, and to reaffirm their their uh, determination to continue to grow and remodel. Um, and I think the future has gotten a little bit more clear over the last month, but uh, we're, we're pleased with what we're hearing out of uh, the early signs of the franchisees and their willingness to go after growth. And, and look, um, you know, you've you got to balance a fine line between doing the right by your system and, and doing right by communities. If, if there's opportunities uh, that make sense for us on the real estate side, uh, we will pursue those, but uh, you, you also uh, you want to balance uh, being a good corporate citizen and, and sticking to your values uh, and not being a shark either. So uh, we're going to walk that tightrope, but uh, that's what that green team is focused on, and I think what you're going to see, you know, our fleet today, 70% uh, of our portfolio uh, has a drive-through. We've added a 1,000 curbsides, many to those non-drive-through locations. So uh, we think we are really well positioned to be a, an on-the-go brand uh, in the new reality. 
Thanks, Dennis. Great, and, and kudos, and kudos uh, on doing the right thing by your franchisees and employees. Thanks, guys. Yeah, appreciate that, Dennis. Thanks. Okay, Thank Nicole. you. This does conclude the question and answer session for today's program. I'd like to hand the program back to Dave Hoffman for any further remarks. No, I just want to thank everyone for being on the call, and uh, we appreciate all the well wishes we got from you and the support you've given us. And, uh, again, I, I know these are uh, trying times, and uh, from the Duncan Brands family and all of our franchisees, we just with, wish all of you, uh, you know, stay safe and stay secure, and, and uh, we'll get through this together. But we appreciate uh, your interest and in, in your, in your commitment to Duncan Brands. Thanks, everyone. Be good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation in today's conference. This does conclude the program. You may now disconnect. Good day.